well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric. I'm here today with Michael. Hi. And uh, Michael, did you know that it's easy to pair two films together? You know, it's it's a lot easier than you'd think and a lot harder than you'd imagine. Yeah, well, last uh, last week, we had. Uh, I've recovered, by the way. As you may be able to tell, I'm no uh-huh. longer suffering from Jonestown. Right. That was, uh, that was a hard show to get through. That was just a hard film to watch. It made me sad. Um, today's film is by comparison, not sad at all. No, not even a little uh, sad. Just by comparison, perhaps. They're actually kind of a lot sad, but... It's, um, we came on the show and we said, uh, we're going to suck it up next week. We're just going to do two movies. And we have, in fact, prepared a theme for today's double feature. Yeah. Which is directors who don't like the police. Directors who don't like the police. See how easy that is? Turns out... You um, just watch the movies and then say something that yeah, happens in both. You pretty much pick the movies first, watch them, and then come up with a theme. And today we picked Assault on Precinct 13 and The Wrong Man. And uh, we also get to talk about John Carpenter and Alfred Hitchcock. Right, which, which is really the conversation to be had about these two films. Well, certainly Assault on Precinct 13. Yeah, I mean, it's two directors that we haven't hit on in a while, and now we get to do that. So we're going to spoil the work of these two directors, specifically films known as Assault on Precinct 13 and The Wrong Man. So you can use the chapters if you haven't seen Assault. We're going to do that first. You can skip over to uh, The Wrong Man. If you haven't seen The Wrong Man, you can skip that. You can go to the end of the show. You have to save this fucking thing on your computer. It's on the website. You can get back to it later. If you haven't seen the movie, don't listen to the show. Just, you know, you'll see the movie at some point. You come back. You talk to us or we talk to you. You can talk back. That's fine. And uh, Assault on Precinct 13. I know that was fast. Did I throw you off? You caught, yeah, well, a little bit. I'm not, I'm not used to anything quick paced. It's a John Carpenter movie. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I would just say one thing just right off the bat okay. about Assault on Precinct 13, and that's gonna, it's gonna make our show about 25 minutes shorter. Okay. Um, I get it. Rio motherfucking Bravo. Yeah. That's, I mean, Howard Hawks, uh, John Wayne, Western. Can we just not talk about any of that? Yeah. I mean, it's all good. over the fucking place. Right. John Carpenter's talking about it. Characters in the movie, name, references. Yep. I totally get it. Yeah. I just don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I want to talk about the other influences, actually. Uh, I want to talk about uh, maybe what's less noted. Things like uh, Shaun of the Dead. I mean, yeah. there are. Uh, this movie seems so influential to me. You know, we're talking about a movie coming out in 1976. This is before action was its own genre. Right. We didn't have, you know, Schwarzenegger wasn't a huge thing until the 80s. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really, I mean, Stallone was, was still just Rocky. If right. That. Yeah. We're not talking about uh, running through the jungle or Terminator or, you know, a lot of these huge movies that started happening in the 80s. I'm not going to say that action didn't exist in the 70s. It right. surely existed. Mm-hmm. But you had genres like black exploitation and kung fu and right. you know these things that were capitalizing on uh on action. Sure. They were putting action Road exploitation. Right, right. They we're trying to action was really a component of every film. Yeah. It wasn't its own thing. We didn't know before a movie like Assault on Precinct 13 that we could just base everything around action. Yeah. Which is weird to say of John Carpenter, because maybe not a name you associate (laughs) with action. Almost not at all. But when you start looking at how thinly this film came together, Mm -hmm. very minimal, very few elements, that's why it seems like an action film. Right. It seems like an action film, because there's just not a lot else to it. Right. Sort of stripped out all of the bullshit. Sure. At least as much as John Carpenter could. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's almost a shame we didn't cover it before Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Because when we start getting to really the core of the movie, it just feels like the attack on the Winchester. You yeah, know what I mean? It does. You can see so much inspiration from this in the uh in the Edgar Wright stuff, in Shaun of the Dead specifically. Yeah, right. So talk to me about this movie a bit. This is uh this is something you own and something that through the years of double feature you have gone back and forth. Yeah. On. It's very often I remember when you saw it and you said, We gotta fucking do this movie. And then about a week and a half later, you said, this movie is terrible. We're not doing this movie. I don't movie. think I ever said it was terrible, but I definitely said that there's not a lot to it, and it's probably <laughs> okay. not worth being covered on the show. 
maybe uh, maybe you weren't familiar with the term minimalism, but see, minimalism is actually a thing where by doing nothing, you do everything. So suddenly you can just go, ah, there's not a lot going on in this movie. It's d- it's minimalism amazing. becomes different when it's John Carpenter. How so? Because John Carpenter is already pretty minimalistic. <laughs> well, good. So this makes for an interesting study. The thing that stood out for me that made me think we need to do this on the show was um, Vanilla Twist scene. Oh my God, Vanilla Twist. This is another one of those things. You bring me this shit. I know you know this makes me nuts yeah. when this stuff happens. Yeah. I, vanilla fucking twist is not a flavor <laughs> of ice cream. Vanilla is a flavor of ice cream. This is literally somebody sat down and said, what if we could put a twist on vanilla? Oh, brilliant. Vanilla twist. Done. Next flavor. Yeah, I don't know. It's not vanilla straw- Vanilla strawberry, that's a real new flavor. You right. take two flavors, vanilla strawberry, you put them together, vanilla strawberry, new flavor. Vanilla twist, not a fucking flavor. But the little girl... You know, she has to go back, right? She can't yeah. just fucking leave it alone. I don't know what Vanilla Twist would even be. Maybe Well, lemon. it's not just vanilla, because clearly she it's wasn't fucking happy with vanilla. It's also visibly different from vanilla. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, she, she doesn't even taste it. She looks at it. She goes, hey, wait a second. This is vanilla. This is not vanilla. I paid for a Vanilla Twist. I don't think she even paid the guy. Right. First of all, the guy wasn't even working. He was working. The shop, it's closed. Music off. Score off. He was working. He was just nervous because there was a car circling his ice cream truck. All right. So first, not a flavor. Second, uh, dead. Right. Which is really, I mean, when someone starts bitching about Vanilla Twist, you should shoot them in the chest. <laughs> I really wish she would have dropped her ice cream, too. That would have made this He a, shot a, through a the ice cream. What more could you want? You're right. You're right. No, it's already perfect. Um, Jaw dropping. Yeah. This, uh, the scene. Well, Holy think- crap. It's just compounded by the fact that he doesn't turn his fucking head. No, not at all. He steps up on the ice cream man who's laying on the ground, and then she says, wait a second, I asked for Vanilla Twist, and without turning his head, the guy just takes the pistol, points it through the ice cream truck, shoots her, and then shoots the ice cream man. Right, he's mildly annoyed. And This is the nuisance for him. She's standing there having the same reaction as the entire audience, which is... Oh my god, did he just shoot the kid? Right, yeah, she's thinking the same fucking thing. And then she falls down, and her dad becomes a bumbling fool for the rest of the film. But also the crux of, uh, I mean, the title. He becomes the crux for why Precinct 13 gets assaulted. But before we get into the actual physical assault of the police station, Mm -hmm. and why I think that there's a lot that goes into setting this up. Cause I know that you brought up, why don't we just start in the police station? Yeah. And it does that. That's a conversation I want to have, Great. but there's a more important and pressing conversation to have about John Carpenter, especially when this is, pro- I believe this is the first film he did the, uh, the Casio for. This is John Carpenter's most complex score yet. <laughs> there are, I believe three entire instruments. Yeah. Well, I believe uh, there this. are three entire songs. <laughs> also true there is the assault on precinct 13 theme uh-huh, there great. is the hold the high note <laughs> right. and there is the feelings something bad has happened yeah right uh there are three pieces of music beautiful <laughs> those are called uh motifs when you use them uh-huh. over and over you see you just create three pieces of music right. and then they you give, say they give it a name instead of just accusing laziness well then you say assault on precinct 13 reprisal yeah, or assault sure. on Precinct yeah, I guess we've seen it with Rocky when they do feelings version of Rocky theme. Yeah, also true. Also true. Although somehow it does feel legitimate when Rocky yeah. does it. You know what I mean? Rocky's we, allowed to get away with We make a jab like at that. John Carpenter for this. Sure. But when Rocky does it, it's just, oh, that's the, the soft version sure. of the theme. Oh, I see what they did there. Yeah. In here, it's it's literally, oh, you didn't have time for a fourth song. You couldn't have done a fourth song. Right. Or really a third song. You couldn't yeah. have made a third song up. Well, and John Carpenter, it's obvious. We talked about it when we did Escape from New York. It's clear from Halloween. Mm-hmm. We've done just about every John Carpenter movie. We're really running out. We're getting into the dubious 90s period of John no, Carpenter. see, you're looking at this all wrong again. We're not running out. We're completing right. the filmography. Well, but the thing is, is I would say completing, except for the dubious 90s period with the James Woods vampire movie. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, so your, your fear, I guess what you're telling me, is that we're eventually going to have to do ghost on mars and I, I ghosts of mars is better ghost of mars ghosts of mars something mars with ghosts that one is actually not as bad aside from ice cube being in it which is weird because ice cube and john carpenter don't exist in the same world <laughs> sure um not part of the same collective universe but this assault on precinct 13 way before ice cube was even in right. nwa or nwa had even existed 
However, there was a gang with attitude in Assault on Precinct 13, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to talk about John Carpenter's score and the fact that it's just John Carpenter probably in a very small room with a very small keyboard. Yeah, tiny keyboard. Just playing some notes. It's That's the way John Carpenter scores are, and I just that's how I want them to always be. It made me uncomfortable when we watched Escape from L.A., and they did the orchestral version sure. of the... Ba-ba-bum. Yeah, right. No, I totally agree. That whole thing makes me uncomfortable. I want it to be small and contained because I feel like John Carpenter films need to remain in this weird transitional period between the late 70s and early 80s yeah. where synthesizers were still actually perceived as wait was that actually strings yeah <laughs> whereas right. by about 1984 everybody knew that they weren't strings you were playing a keyboard and you were in depeche mode i'm only comfortable ripping on the score because it is actually amazing yeah i probably wouldn't use a crazy word like brilliance uh, I don't know. I throw that word off. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Whatever. Brilliant. It's a brilliant score. Yeah. It's uh, ballsy. Well, it's the most distinct part of the film. Yeah, it is. This doesn't feel uh, the same at all without that score. Uh-huh. You know, the little girl running up to the ice cream truck, yep. juxtaposed, you know, with the, Against with that the bad stuff's score. about to happen score. I, seriously. Yeah. It's, it gives this movie a mood and a feeling that you just you don't get it without right. that you absolutely need that that's more true here than any score ever in anything i i'm totally inclined to agree with you so i don't know if he literally just has one keyboard or we make <laughs> fo- wouldn't that be great if there was just some keyboard that had all of the john carpenter sounds that would be amazing. that he's ever used and it's, i think there's three sounds yeah but we might have it all wrong maybe he has 35 keyboards that that's he's true intricately uh you know processing together to get these different sounds the man has many talents he is credited as the helicopter pilot in at least five of his films i'm amazed uh you know who else is credited in this film is deborah hill that's true so this is but not as a producer or as a girlfriend (laughs) um this is you know pre the days when uh deborah hill was the big john carpenter producer and uh and i guess also before she was john carpenter's girlfriend i think they met working on this yeah And uh, she was the writer Mm -hmm. for Assault on Precinct 13 and would later come on to be, you know, I I think it was Halloween that she was the the producer on first just because they needed a producer and why not Deborah Hill? She's moving into that territory. And we start to see a bit of the the camera style stuff. Yeah. Well, Um, and the special effects. Yeah, that too. That too. Or lack thereof. Well, I mean, uh, you know, I talked a little bit before about really liking that opening camera shot from yeah. uh, Halloween, that being really showy. Right. We have the a camera attached to the front of the car yeah. with the focal points on the, you know, the rear car. Mm-hmm. The whole thing shot in 35 millimeter. It's a, it's a two, three, five to one movie with a wide angle lens for a lot of the scenes. It, you know, it's another thing that gives it a distinct feeling, a distinct look. Yeah. I think you have empty police station yep. uh, with nobody in it. A fucking two, three, five to one wide angle lens and John Carpenter score that almost pretty I much mean, completes. You could th- essentially do anything else. I and- think really, I I feel like the the finishing touches to that are entirely practical effects. Sure, and somebody that constantly needs a cigarette. You know, I think there might be one more thing. What's that? Let me ask you this question. Okay, you don't have a lot of money for your movie. Uh huh. How do you light the movie? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you just don't. Uh, this is this is probably actually kind of hard to yeah. do to like this uh because everything is, i mean they're indoors and it appears as if there's no lights right there's no lights where you can look at it and sure. say, everything is implied moonlighting sure well they would ever device it right with though the power got cut yeah whatever right. device the light's gone yeah for real the light's gone yeah and i don't know if that made filming this movie harder or easier it certainly makes it look more distinct yeah. because everything is just fucking dark the whole time it's always you know moonlight coming in from the windows that's yeah. it and i constantly i don't know if this happens to you but every time i watch this movie you see shady silhouettes of endless waves of gang members you mean zombies <laughs> coming through windows vents doorways whatever and people will shoot them before they have moved into lighting right and i always think wait what if that's a good guy right. every time right i think you know don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes or the whites of their skin or blacks or Hispanic 
Latino, Asian. There is no discrimination with the gangs. I have been black for over 35 years. Um, the strange little writing, they do yeah. fit the little jokes yeah. in, in here, apologizing for that. I love that he, he makes the joke. It's almost in writing. Yeah. We know this is going to be a bad joke. Sure. We'll just have him say sorry. They're doing afterwards. a table read. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm glad you bring up all the, the gang members. Yeah. Who never get any dialogue. Right. Who you don't, I mean, they're a, a faceless wall of people. Right. And a surprising number of them. I had this feeling in the beginning that this would just be six people. Who were, right, yeah. And, they kind of uh, look like the Backstreet Boys set yeah. up in the middle of the street. This is just diehard for me. This right. is a team of people uh, <laughs> responsible for all the problems. But it's not. It's a ton of people. And it almost becomes, you know, the fog, if not Dawn sure. of the Dead. Sure. It's an enemy that you don't really know. Right. All you need to know is they're the enemy. Mm -hmm. That's that's really all you need. Well, but that, and that they'll stop at nothing to kill you, that they have thrown sure. down the cholo. Sure, that too. It gives them this kind of, uh, they become mysterious at that yeah. point. You know, maybe it reminds me of the fog because it seems like there's something magic about them. Right. Because they just have magic potions they're throwing at the, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but you don't know who any of them are too. They're a complete, unknown factor mm -hmm. and uh and i think at that point now we've we've honestly found the core elements of assault on precinct 13 and here's here's we're gonna get into the conversation of why not start right in the fucking police station yeah i really like this setup i like all of these people converging on this empty police station for varying reasons because you have the girl's father looking for refuge. Sure. The police officer who's been assigned to take care of the facility because it's his first day and he doesn't get a real job. Right. Some right. leftover secretaries, some prisoners who've been derailed to stopping there because one of them was sick. It's basically the first portion of the film is assembling the ragtag team of guys that are going to be forced to work together against a greater enemy. Forced together for Project Save Ass. Yeah, for Project Save Ass. So this is that actor actually we've seen on Rocky. Yeah, right. He's uh Apollo Creed's uh advisor. Sure. Um but he's he's probably one of the funniest parts of this movie. Had the actor also been a producer on the movie, they might have had enough money to pay the rights to rock, paper, scissors so they didn't have to <laughs> play what is it? Potato Potatoes. Something. It's yeah. just called it's, it's literally called just potatoes. potatoes. That's yeah. all you get. It's, it's like rock, paper, scissors if there were only rocks, except they're not rocks, they're <laughs> yeah. potatoes. And you punch each other's fists, count to, I think, 11. I think and you then, count to a nursery rhyme. I think you count to 11, spell out the word you, and then try to punch one of the fists is how that works. Um, Ma making for the most awkward moment of any John right. Carpenter. Everybody treats it like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's just, we're just playing potatoes. But there's one more, the one character that I really want to focus on mm -hmm. with Assault on Precinct 13 is Wilson. Snake Plissken? Yeah. I mean, he is Snake Plissken. He is the demo of Snake Plissken, right? The beta version. He has this backstory that he refuses to tell anybody about. Right. He has a weird nickname that he will only tell somebody at the point of dying, sure. which comes back as a joke. Because the first time when the cop asks him, where'd you get a name like Napoleon? He says, I'll tell you when at the point of dying. Right. Second time he gets asked the question, when? Probably in a few minutes. <laughs> right. And then these hordes of, of zombie criminals come running down. But this guy is just this fearless, badass criminal He's totally evil because right. he's killed at least three people, it seems. It seems. I mean, before the slaughter of the other gang members. Right. He seems like a nice guy, a genuine human being. Sure. He just has this weird dynamic of being a jerk, but a lovable jerk. Right. And it's great juxtaposed against this incredibly benevolent police officer who is the only good cop. Yeah. In Assault on Precinct 13. Yeah, in existence, if, if yeah. this is John Carpenter's world. Right. We get all these lines about how cops don't actually help you. That's just something teachers tell kids. Sure. And how these police officers, I'm not going to drive down there. What's down there? Nothing down there. I'm bored. Yeah, it's just, it's lazy cops. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's clearly a film made by people who are not fans of the police. The first time we ever see police officers that aren't the our lead... It's the other it's the other cops in the same police station where the one cop is kind of racist and he's either racist or thinks that this guy's a newbie. Right. Completely disrespects him. Sure. And the other police chief 
calls or he's in the middle of a phone call and says, uh, just don't bother me. Right. Stop whining. Right. It makes for this perfect scenario of why it can't be all police officers, why criminals have to work with cops. Right. And why these criminals are different than this gang of relentless fiends. What forces these people together and sure. what makes them a force that's different from just the rough inhuman right. you know, criminals. Exactly. These are all human beings here. Over there are, it's a gang, it's ruffians, uh -huh. it's, uh, it's the inhuman. You know, one other thing that strikes me as something I, I've never really seen before is this, uh, this incredibly unique shootout they have. Yeah. It's, I don't even know if it's, is it a shoot in? I mean, there's yeah, no, it, there's, there's no exchange just, of fire. There's just this wonderful scene where it shows the police station being ravaged and riddled by bullets, but actually by squibs and uh, cutting in and out of shots. Yeah, I mean, it looks like nothing else. Yeah, and things are blowing up. Things are, papers are flying, lights are being shot out, every window being destroyed. And people just have to lay down and watch them massacre yeah. this building. Yeah, it's simultaneously having uh, all your budget go to waste in one scene and also just having no budget. Right. I mean, it's the same kind of thing... You know, we, we give our characters a window to look out so we can shoot the same scene over uh -huh. and over and over and just cut back to it. The do not enter signs that we shoot about five seconds of that and it chews up about 20 minutes of the mm -hmm. film. Uh, I remember reading John Carpenter saying something to the effect of, you know, when you're shooting a low budget movie, the key, and this will get back to his, uh, our constant trying to figure out John Carpenter pacing. Uh -huh. uh, at this point, we, we know he's known for it, but this might be another clue. Sure. He's talking about you just make all your scenes really long and then yeah. you have to shoot less scenes. <laughs> done. Job done for you. But this is a ton of edits in this uh, shootout, in the initial assault yeah. scene, for whatever effects reason, because they could only fire one shot in at a time right. and they had to splice these things together. So it's as if the movie is being chopped up and mangled just as yeah. much as the station. Yeah, is. it's really, it's it's jarring, but in, in a way that you really want it to be. You know, they start shooting the windows out and it's oddly quiet because of the suppressors mm -hmm. on the guns. But that really helps make for that odd feel. And you get papers being blown into the air right. as if that's supposed to have an, as much weight to it as the windows yeah. being shot out. But what else do you have in the room? You have to just blow papers around. Yeah. There's nothing else for they you to create. shoot a clock the off the wall too early to yeah, shoot right. anything else. Like, the clock goes down quick. It's such a long, carnage-inducing kind of scene, but it's so quiet. It's so non-threatening. It's like being flicked in the arm for seven fucking minutes straight. And I just, I really like the way this film ends. There's all this carnage. The police station, as we just discussed, but also they blow up the gang. They explode them using flares and some kind of chemical flares and dubious science right then we have this cop and this criminal both of them clearly they're not going to be friends for life okay? sure they've gone through an ordeal it's been awful they've managed to survive with each other the cop knows the criminal is still going to death row but they walk out together and it's kind of this it feels like they're winning yeah but then you kind of think back to the scene. There are no heroes anymore. There's just people who follow orders. And you know, the cop's not going to get anything out of this. Criminal's just going to go to jail. Really, the heroic moment is the fact that they get to walk out together. Yet somehow it feels like it should end in a super 80s high five freeze right, frame. Right, it totally air. does. <laughs> it's part of the influence, man. It's part of the influence of this film. So we've covered... Um, Mr. Famous Director John Carpenter. Let's move into the probably the most famous director of all time. And that is Neil Marshall. Exactly. Actually, I'm going to go with Alfred Hitchcock. Neil Marshall's The Wrong Man is... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was going to see how far I could take that. But before we get into the film, I know that you got to discuss John Carpenter's score and simultaneously bring it up and tear it down because yeah. that's kind of how it works. Sure. I'm going to do that with in brevity with the one thing I dislike about Alfred Hitchcock. And the reason I get to do it before you get to talk about the film is because he does it before the film starts. Sure. Alfred Hitchcock has this tendency to do this thing where he thinks he's really good right. at everything he does. Thing is, he is probably that yeah, good. Right. Um, but it still drives me nuts. And I hate that he gets to come out and stand in silhouette say you're hearing the voice of Alfred Hitchcock right, right. and then explain that the film is true and it's all true and every word of it is true and this is my film and I've brought you a lot of suspense thrillers over the years but ladies and gentlemen I'm about to blow you away once again 
please enjoy the wrong man. At least he doesn't read the credits. Right. That's true. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. And I, I enjoy it. I look forward to seeing it, but in this sado yeah i know i know exactly what you're saying of just like i hate it and i right. don't want to see it but i it's i just i love it and hate it simultaneously we talked a lot about bad cat last week yeah it kind of reminds me of that yeah how many times did i call it a stupid cat yeah yeah we love bad cat it's shameful and i'm glad it happens right but it's i just i turn my head a little bit and wince as it's happening this is always an easy one for me because one it's more hilarious than the yeah, other one it really is it's yeah. not a, woo, that's why a took, cameo that's why in the I film took it out here yeah. yeah it's um it happens before the film so i always pretend it's not part of the right. film that's exactly what you Again, said to me. i mean i guess just to keep going back to jonestown jonestown starts with this documentary is created in part by ford like i yeah. don't pretend that's part of the documentary right. i just cut that right out of there all that pbs stuff i pretend it's not even there and that's what happens in the beginning of The Wrong Man. Alfred Hitchcock comes out and he says, this man is accused by Ford. And I just cut it out. It's done. <laughs> we also get uh, Henry Fonda coming back. Um, I love onto the Fondas. Double feature. Yeah. Uh, great in 12 Angry Men. Yep. And uh, probably He's really good in Once Upon a Time in the West. When we have seven hours to spare, we will definitely cover Once Upon a Time in the that's West. That's all I ask for. He is our wrongly accused man here. Yeah. And, you know, when we first started doing Hitchcock, I mentioned that there was uh, really an era Mm -hmm. of Hitchcock movies, of The Wrongly Accused. I mean, I think of it as an era, but it's actually all over. Yeah, it's, it's all over all of a films. running theme. I mean, I, I think that started with The Lodger in uh, the late 20s. Yeah. And it's something that just, you know, there might have been a few more of them in the 50s, but all over, every decade, every era, the 39 Steps, uh, North by Northwest, Frenzy he did in 72, which is a whole wrong man thing. And then there's a bunch I haven't seen, too. I think The Trouble with Harry and The Young and the Innocent are both wrongly accused things, too. Wow. There are so many Alfred Hitchcock movies. There really are. <laughs> there's, I'm also amazed at how many of them I've actually seen mm -hmm. without sitting down and saying, I'm going to watch every single Alfred yeah. Hitchcock movie I'm amazed ever. at how few I've actually seen. It seems like you would accidentally stumble across yeah. more of them. Sure. There are so many just song titles named after Alfred Hitchcock movies, which is literally enough to make me watch your film. Somebody names a song after it. I like the song. I go, this must be a great movie. You put a sample in there and I will, I will go and get that movie before your song even ends. Yeah, I bet you do. So Alfred Hitchcock said this thing once about his, his feeling uh, about the law. Uh, because when you see this guy do the same thing in so many movies, you have to go find an interview or something. And uh, he said, I'm not against the police. I'm just afraid of them. Right. And I think that uh, that beautifully summarizes, you know, the the impression you would get from watching these movies, or if, sure. if not the impression you get, the way you should be looking at, yeah. you know, his view of the police, mm -hmm. uh, the movie's interpretation of the law, and more so how it's carried out. When he was uh, really young, Hitchcock was locked up for like, I mean, five or ten minutes. It wasn't okay. a big deal. For swearing in front of his mother. For assaulting a, a precinct. Oh, okay. When he was 13. That kid was way younger than 13. I'm sorry. Um, he pissed off his dad about something. I don't, I don't know exactly what it was. Okay. It was one of those things, arrested development style where oh, dad's going right. to teach you a lesson. Sure. So we sent him to the station with a letter that I don't know what the letter said. Lock my son up for five to 10 uh -huh. minutes. So it is just like in assault on precinct 13. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's basically what's going on. And so Hitchcock kind of developed this fear of the police or maybe just this fear of going to prison. He didn't want to be wrongly accused himself. Right. And he'd sure. go way out of his way not to come in contact with police uh, to the point where he never even learned to drive huh. because his thought was you his start thought driving. Was what you other to... drivers like you and me have realized after the fact, which right. is driving only leads to more money and more encounters with the police. <laughs> I think basically every encounter I've ever had with the police uh, was for driving related stuff. Dare. Ah, the dare program. That is total bullshit. So the best thing we can really do to describe this movie is to uh, to point out that this is not a piece of film noir. Okay. Sometimes it gets lumped into film noir because something, something, crime, something up must be film noir. Right. Well, there's more there's more shots of light coming through blinds in the previous film on this double feature than this. That's one. definitely true. Yeah. Here we actually get light coming through jail bars, creating right. the effect of jail bars. <laughs> But, you know, you might be able to call this a crime film. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination you could call it noir. Furthermore, I would go on to say 
the things that makes this not a noir are the defining elements. I would of this. totally agree. You from could, what I know about noir, you, <laughs> you you know plenty about noir. We've done I don't know eight of them on uh, on really? the show. Uh, probably not, but this show is so much more beneficial to me and you than it is to anybody who listens. I know, isn't that true? If you're not though, Michael, I will somehow find a way to get more noir on oh, the show. I have no doubts. I think the last uh, the last one we really did was the killing. Okay, and yeah, we sure. did Rafifi before that, uh-huh. and um, Postman Always Rings twice. Touch of Evil. I forget we did Postman Always Rings twice. We did Double Indemnity. Right. We, we got quite a few on the show so far. The first thing is that there's no sex, right? I mean, not in the motive. There's no femme fatale. Um, not all film noir needs to include a femme fatale. Right. Not all film noir needs to be motivated by sex. Uh, just in the last couple titles I mentioned, you know, we don't see both of those characteristics. Mm-hmm. In some of the films, we don't see either of yep. those characteristics. But I think the bigger thing, and the term that gets thrown out on every noir show, is hard-boiled detective. Or even just the term hard-boiled. Yeah. Right? I mean, when you go back to the uh the idea of well what is a hard-boiled detective Uh you know these guys are called hard-boiled because they are tough they put themselves in danger and they have this sort of attitude this sort of do not give a shit i'm better than you know this ego this huge ego about them and so they're known for really being the opposite of sentimental they don't have a soft spot right and sentimental might be the first word I use to describe the wrong man. Oh, yeah. If this movie is anything, it is sad, it is human, it is sentimental. You're supposed to be feeling for Manny the whole time, and it just gets worse. And the thing is, is when he gets proven innocent, mm-hmm. his wife is still a nut job. Yeah, and right. By the time he's sitting in the courtroom, the one that... The one that ends up being a mistrial. Yeah. He's sitting there. It shows him he's worn down. He's beaten... Peter Fonda gets this wonderful glimmer in his eyes. He just, I don't know if that's an acting chop thing or if it's just something he naturally has, but the way they light it, you see his eyes. It looks like they're welling up with oceans of sadness. Sure. And I'm sitting there going, even if you're innocent, your wife is gone. Yeah. You have lost your wife. Yeah. Because this is a tragic story about a man, you know, we're seeing this tragedy the whole time. Sure. The tragedy isn't, oh, at the end he's going to be convicted and he's wrongly accused and isn't that sad. No. The tragedy is that his life is being destroyed by merely the act of being wrongly accused, merely being drugged through, you know, this trial and having to use his fucking bail time to investigate his own crime. Yeah. You know, and so in feeling for this guy, I mean, we talked about uh, in Portrait of a Serial Killer, and we we mentioned it really recently on 12 Angry Men, uh-huh. are the police trying to find the guy or simply a guy? Right. If they think the evidence will stick, do they really care if they found yeah. the right suspect or are they just looking for the right piece to fit in the hole? And so I start to think I'm feeling for Manny. I'm feeling for Rose. I The, the thing that's happening to these people, it's awful. And I, uh, who do you blame? Do you blame the police? I mean, who's the fucking villain here? The villain is the guy who's actually been doing the robbing. Okay. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> I mean, it, to me, it seems that every single person is the villain because yeah. we're, we're following Manny well, so closely, yeah, but I mean, you're right. You're, you're angry. And every time the women say, anytime any of the people say that's the guy that does it, you want to beat him up. You know, you want to oh, yell yeah, at them. You think, fuck them. Yeah. You, you hear think, the prosecutor from yeah. the other side. Fuck that you guy. Just, you're just mad because you know they're wrong. Sure. But unfortunately, the flip side of the coin is they don't know they're wrong. No, not As at far all. as they're concerned, they're right. No, and they're trying to help. Yeah. Which you know? we talked about again back on 12 Angry Men, but they, they are, they feel like they're correct and that this is actually the guilty party. And it's not their fault. Sure. The only person who's really in the wrong here is, I mean, maybe the police for not doing a full investigation. But honestly, you if you have enough evidence, you shouldn't continue looking for evidence, right? Right. Yeah. I don't mean, waste the time. I don't know enough about the inner workings of how that investigation right. goes to really say, you know, with any kind of idea of efficacy where you stop. Right. But you have this guy who clearly, I mean, there's at least some evidence against him. For a movie that, you, the way we're describing it might sound like it's cynical of police. Sure. The police do question him. They give him several opportunities to do the handwriting thing. Yeah. And while, you know, handwriting analysis, that's also up, total bullshit, I it guess. It ends up not being about the handwriting. No, it's it about the It starts that way, but it ends up that he misspells the same thing as the previous guy, which... 
Again, an upsetting coincidence, but still something that would set off some alarms. Yeah, right. If I mean, if I were doing some sort of completely layman's investigation, sure. not as a detective, no experience, that would definitely pique my interest at least. Yeah, and right. I would keep an eye on that guy. Sure. You know what I mean? Especially if then you parade him through a bunch of people's places who have seen the guy and without fail, they all say, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. We start getting back into the 12 angry men territory where, where 11 people say guilty and without any evidence to myself, I've never seen the guy. I'm inclined to believe that they're probably right. Well, and these people had a terrible thing done to them as well. Right. I mean, they were held up. So uh, while we're standing here saying, well, fuck that woman, you know, fuck these people over here. I mean, something awful happened to them. Right. And now they're trying to, if this is their story and we're following them, we're thinking, oh, finally, retribution. Sure. They found the guy. There's the guy. Know? So we could find a lot of holes where the investigation maybe wasn't done really well. Doesn't It wasn't done perfectly. And the movie points out later that the handwriting thing isn't really that big of a deal anyways. Um, the, you know, you might say that lining these two women up next to each other and having them both point out the guilty party yeah. isn't quite the double blind study perhaps yeah. that you wish it was, but putting aside these sort of, uh, I mean, this is cinematic suspension of disbelief, mm-hmm. you know, they're showing us in a very visual way how they're identifying the subjects, assuming that uh, they did all of those things correctly. It really is just the guy who committed the crime yeah. that is at fault. But he's not the one thrown in the cell. It's Manny thrown in the cell, and it sucks. It is hard. Uh, when he first enters that cell, I mean, these are the Hitchcock fears it, at their most pure, you sure. know, at having that door bang shut and staring at those bars. Right, and when he's walking out of the courtroom after the arraignment, and he sees his wife, Yeah, and it's just, I mean, he walks in, they set bail, he walks out and he's just craning his neck as he walks out of the doorway. Sure. One last glimpse because he doesn't know if he's ever going to be back out of that cell. And another thing that uh, both helps you feel it and ties in with his profession, being a bass player, is uh, is the score for the movie. You know, when you get in the prison, you have uh, this deep, deep bass. I mean, you know, you feel every fucking note plucked out of that thing. It's uh, the sound of your stomach falling out as you enter that jail cell. It, it, like, you can't believe what's happening to you. Mm-hmm. You can't believe, wow, I'm really here. This reality is hitting you. You are thinking, man, I'm in jail now. This is right. awful. I, how did I get here? Right. It's that moment that is the pinnacle of Hitchcock's fear. It is that right. moment that I've not only been wrongly accused, here I am now. I'm, I'm fucking yeah. in jail. It gets to the point where you... When you're in jail, that's the point where you start going, oh, my God, what if the legal system doesn't actually work? What if innocent people can actually end up in jail for things they didn't do? That's the even more terrifying implication is it's not just me. What if what if half of the people in this jail didn't do anything? And later that uh, that same score goes on to add some harp stuff and does some some more interesting things on the high end, too. But I always just love the bass part of it. Mm-hmm. I always just love that deep low end. It has this terrible effect on me that makes me just uh, a, a tiny bit nauseous, if not yeah. excited at how good <laughs> it is. You know, and you think it can't get any worse for him. Uh, but at least he has the love and commitment of his totally sane wife, right? That goes out the window uh, right about the time she has uh, doubts about his own innocence and then hits him with a hairbrush. <laughs> right. Yeah, she goes mad. Pretty fucking fast. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about that being one of the things it destroys, and that's bad enough, but it makes this immediate situation even worse because she is all his support. Right, She exactly. is his companion. Right. He's now alone in this. You know, he has his lawyer, but, I mean, that guy's so detached and maybe not even reliable, not being a his, criminal his lawyer, lawyer. His lawyer is supportive from nine to five. Yeah, his lawyer is there as a tool. But not as a friend. Right. He does not have a friend in this. He does not have a companion in this anymore. He is fighting this fight absolutely alone. And when you see that mistrial, something that in my head seems like a victory, seems like, oh, I get to spend more time away from prison. Mm -hmm. To him, this trial is crushing him. That is actually worse than not having a mistrial. That's more time going by. Right. Although they throw up the fucking title card at the end and say, no, don't worry, everything, 
everything's okay. Two it's, years later, she was sane, and they moved to Florida. Right. This movie does end on a downer yeah. and a, a very respectable downer ending sure. to the point that that final title card almost strikes me as the lights come up in the theater and people start leaving bummed and the producers rush out and start yelling, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. Two years later, everything was fine. They yeah. all left. It's okay. But also, I mean, if it is true, I guess that's part of the story you could also mention. It if seems a little dishonest to end on the sure. she was crazy forever note if it didn't actually go down that way. Again, we're getting into our uh, favorite territory, which is based on a true story. And by favorite, you mean territory where we don't give a shit. Yeah, exactly. Film's over, story's over, time to move on. The website for this show that you're listening to right now, the show's uh-huh. called Double Feature. Okay. The website is called doublefeatureshow.com. Wow, that's, or that's really at least easy the, to remember. The address of it. It's because we can't get doublefeature.com. Right. Now, if you, the listener, think there's anything you can do to get us doublefeature.com, we'd be all over that. Yeah. But uh, that Lycos website from 1992 does <sighs> not want to give up their fucking domain. You can send us an email, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. What should people email us? Um, I don't know. Today was uh, today. I feel like we comprehensively covered anything. We don't have any questions. So I guess uh, naked pictures this week. You are just completely setting us up for failure here. <laughs> we have covered every single thing about both of these movies. We left no details out. And there's actually nothing factually incorrect. Even our opinions are pure scientifically based, absolutely provable facts. Right. So if you disagree with any of that, I guess you could email us, but no one will email us right. because all of that's inherently true. It's important to note that today's podcast was based on a true story. Oh, and, God. Um, all right. Everything that You're we've done. said You're is totally, absolutely true. I'm cutting you off. We have movies next time on the show. Now, uh, I don't want to say we're down in a little rut because, mm-hmm. again, after Jonestown, everybody's having a great time sure. this week with wrongly accused fucking assault yeah. double feature. But let's just, I mean, let's go polar opposite. Great. It's John Waters' time. Yeah. But we're going to need something else, too. What, what, what movies do we have? Let's do Hairspray and Little Shop of Horrors. Now, you mentioned John Waters, and I want to make sure that that's clear. We're doing the original Hairspray, not anything that has to do with singing. There is no singing in Got it. Hairspray that we're doing. John Waters, not John Travolta. Right. And then we're going to do Little Shop of Horrors. Also important to note... No singing in no the singing. Little Shop of Horrors. We're going to do the Roger Corman Little Shop of Horrors from the 50s or early 60s. So this will be a non-singing episode of Singing Double this Features. This is going to be the basis of massive cult operas. Much better defined. All right. In that case, watch more fucking film. Bye.